Jenna, thanks for joining us today and sharing a little bit of your story with us so we can uh, hopefully make a difference. Where should you technically be right now? Technically, I should probably be in prison. Because you're a really tough chick, out of control, is that oh, right? Oh yeah, yep, <laughs> that's me. Yeah. So that means you're on parole, is that right? That's right. Okay, okay. So uh, how did you end up in there? How did you end up in prison? You don't seem like a, a kind of out of control, psycho kind of you know, burglar, thief, violent person. Absolutely not, that's no. not me at all. I'm mm -hmm. probably quite the opposite. Okay. It just came down to a few bad decisions I made when I was younger, okay. unfortunately. So what was the event that actually got you incarcerated, put in jail? A really, really bad car accident. Okay, yep. tell me about that. I met my very good friend at the time, Carl, in primary school. And um, we weren't friends back then, but then as we grew up, we got, you know, a bit friendly. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, when we were about 20 years old, we went out um, because we were heavily into the rave scene. We loved to party, mm -hmm. absolutely loved the drugs as well, unfortunately. <laughs> But um, yeah, we went out one night looking for some juice, as we called it, GHB, okay. and um, started driving home. I didn't, I honestly did not feel anything. I thought I was fine. And then all of a sudden I wake up in hospital one morning after being in a coma for three days. And then someone, my mum told me I was in an accident. And three I said- Three day coma? Yeah, that's right, yep. And um, I said to mum, where's Carl? I couldn't actually talk, so I had a tracheostomy in place. Right. And so my parents brought me in this, uh, this Magna Doodle yeah, that you yeah. use to write and then yeah, you can yeah. erase it out. I wrote, where's Carl? And then she told me Carl died. It was horrible. As a result of the car accident, obviously. Yeah, that's right. And were you driving, were you? Yes. So what was the upshot of that? Obviously there was charges laid. What, what, were the, what was the police action regarding that? Oh, you know, I was so young, 20 years old. I had no idea how much trouble I was in. I just thought it was a really tragic accident. And then after I was in rehab as an outpatient, I got called to do a police interview. And by this stage, um, people had advised me to go and see my, see, get a solicitor. Mm -hmm. And while they told me to say no comment, uh, I went to the interview and just said, honestly, everything that I could recall. And this is still, meanwhile, knowing, had, having no idea that I was in so much trouble. And then after that, they put me on bail, then did a trial and ended myself in prison. So what were the charges in the end? I got charged with one count of culpable driving, right. causing death. Yep. And how much uh, jail time were you given for that? I got five years jail with two and a half years to serve. Sure, and then the parole period, obviously. That's right, yep. Hence where we are today. Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> now, obviously, that is a, is a tragic story and uh, the loss there is is significant to yourself, obviously to your friend's life. He's yep. he's passed away, and that's that's a shocking tragedy. But there's also a lot of other losses in your world. You know, obviously that time. Um, tell me about some of the personal consequences for you during that time. Obviously, till that the night of that accident, everything was rosy and happy. I'm assuming everyone was good times. Is Absolutely, that yes. Yeah, life yep. is great. I'm on top. No, I'm in charge. Yeah, it's all good. So from that point on, what have been some of the consequences that, uh, that you've experienced as a result of that one night? Well, the list goes on and on. I've lost so much just from that one night. I really have. And the losses go up to, um, you know, even today. At the time, obviously, I lost my, uh, my independence. As, uh, you know, after I came out of hospital, I couldn't even walk. I had to learn how to walk again and um, speak again because uh, I, I lost some teeth. I had to go and see a speech pathologist and uh, learn how to do daily things such as shopping. So just, yeah, my independence in general, obviously my best friend. I lost just uh, my general direction in life, which I must admit that I, I didn't really have any back at that time anyway. Sure. So, and um, after a while, I lost my freedom, yep. uh, getting um, into jail. Yeah, do you lose any uh, career prospects or? or any study or anything like that? About 10 months after the accident, I decided I wanted to do nursing. I felt that that was my true, my true calling because in rehab I'd met some amazing nurses and they just um, really inspired me to become a nurse wow. and help people That's such great. as myself. So I started doing the nursing traineeship and um, when I went into jail, I only had one exam to go and one clinical placement day. And the only reason I couldn't go to the clinical placement was because I had to go to court. So. I went in and 
I did not get my certificate before that. So wow. I was absolutely shattered. Yeah, I was absolutely. so upset. So, yep, I lost that. Now um, I will continue to do it, which is good. Yep. Actually, I met this guy eight months after my accident. This guy who just swept me off my feet pretty much. We had an amazing time together. Uh, two years we were together for before I went into jail. Okay. And um, he stayed with me the whole time up until about six months ago. And um, unfortunately, it didn't work out for us and I lost him as well. I thought he was the love of my life. I really did. So I was, I'm still heartbroken to this day. Sure, I yeah. understand that. I lost my licence, of course. Now I'm a 25-year-old having to rely on my parents to drive me around and the bus, the public transport system. After having independence, it's hard work, isn't it? Yes, yeah. it's horrible. Yeah. Uh, I've lost a lot of friends along the way, people who I thought were my friends, but turned out not to be friends at all. Were they fellow users? Uh, or were they, yeah. were they genuine friends? Some, I found out who my real friends are. Okay, great. Yep, and uh, the rest, I'd call them drug associates or ravers, yeah. you know, just randoms that you meet out here and there and, you know, and you think you're awesome friends because you're both off your face and just having a really great time. But then when some, something happens and they're not beside you in near your hospital bed, you realise who is and who really does care. Yeah, that's an important distinction, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, and who comes to visit you in prison, who really yeah. cares. Yeah, wow. And that's a, that's a very important distinction because I think a lot of people don't realise that the, in my experience as well, and obviously you've borne that out with your own story here, that those connections are very shallow and it's around, it's around the recreational drug that the relationship exists and once that evaporates so you're not involved in that scene, all of a sudden you're gone. You don't exist anymore. That's right. And the things you need, where you really need help and support, you're not getting it. So that's really important. So with your family, you've lost a lot, obviously, Jenna, a lot. And uh, and that's uh, absolutely terrible. I mean, I, I can only imagine experience with people over the years, I've experienced similar, similar things with people I've dealt with. But what about family? What about y your, your immediate family? What sort of impact did this have on them? Uh, you know, one thing I realised is that out of everyone that you know, the only true thing that will stick by you is your family. And uh, I just feel horrible about everything that I've put them through over my entire life. I've put them through absolute hell. <laughs> I'd hate to be someone's, um, I'd hate to have a daughter like myself. <laughs> yeah, I just really feel for them. But at the end of the day, they've been really forgiving and accepting of me. And they're happy to support me, you know, with uh, the decisions that I do make in the future, if they're good decisions, that's really. Good. Yeah. yeah. Well, they care enough to support you in the good times, and support you in the bad times, but not just validate every decision you make, which is which is good, isn't it? Yeah. It sounds like a responsible parent. Yep. That's what you need, don't you? That's right. Yeah, that's good. And our mum said to me the night of the accident, she was, uh, even though I wasn't really that home that often, she heard something hovering over. Uh, above the house, a helicopter, oh, okay. and she just had this feeling and she thought to herself, I hope that's not Jenna in an accident. Mm. And sure enough, the police came knocking at the door at about 10.30, or quarter to 11 at night time, and I uh, told her about my accident. How did she handle that? How was she feeling when that when that when the police knock on the door? And what were her experiences? Did she share those with you at all? Oh, no, but I could only imagine. I'm sure that her heart would have absolutely sunk in yeah. her chest and um, she would have just been distressed and... Yeah, horrified. Yeah. yeah. So you were saying that even though you were disconnected, like you were kind of doing your own thing and, and, and basically home was just a place to crash. Yeah, pretty, pretty much. much. Yeah, okay, Mum always yeah. said, don't treat this house as a hotel, but that's exactly what I did. Okay, but they still stuck by you anyway. Yeah. It's quite remarkable, isn't it? It is. Tell me, when, when did you start looking at the whole drug thing, experimenting with drugs? When did that start for you? Well, it all started when I was about 14 years old. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I put it down to the fact that I wanted to fit in and be popular with all the other girls at my school. So they um, were all doing drugs, were they? Uh, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they, they were smoking, though. I know uh, okay, that. And they right. all had boyfriends and were drinking. And I was never really um, a popular kind of person. Okay. Although at the now that I recall... I was popular always, but for the wrong reasons. Right. Okay. <laughs> now looking back. What do you think caused that perception of popularity? What sort of contributed to that, do you think? Oh, the fact that I was, um, that I turned out to be so rebellious and okay. always doing the wrong thing, like smoking bongs behind yeah. on the oval at school. So that, that generated a sense of image for you, that, that got you a bit of a social kudos. 
Yeah, that's right. right. Social collateral. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I just cool. wanted to be, um, uh, I guess, popular at the start, like as a you know pretty cheerleader style t kind of popular, uh, okay. if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then it turned out that I wanted to be um, popular by being a rebel and standing out from the crowd and right. yeah. So were you the one that initiated the drug use or did someone initiate it for you? Someone did invite you to be involved or did you just say, hey, I'm going to be the dope supplier for the school or did, what, what <laughs> happened? Tell, tell us what happened there. Did someone give you, introduce you to smoking or tell us? Uh, it was actually my curiosity. Right. Uh, I found a cigarette on the floor of the yeah, eight girls' locker. Right. And I picked it up, took it home and decided to give it a go, give it, try and smoke. Okay. I remember sitting on my dad's panel van at the front of the house and I took my first drag and all I could feel was the world going around <laughs> and just having a huge head spin. It was yeah, horrible. Just, just shocker. That's it just cigarettes. Awful. That's yeah. crap. Yeah, so right. I ran upstairs and um, absolutely flopped on my bed and it was just <laughs> awful. And um, I really don't know why I kept smoking. That should have been the best deterrent in the world. Yeah, for so, sure. Why would anyone do this? Yeah. yeah. But you kept going, didn't you? I did. So what compels someone in that having that experience, such you know, a, a obviously adverse reaction to this thing called a cigarette, and that's not uncommon. In fact, most people I've spoken to who've, who've started cigarette smoking have that, that adverse response, like, oh, everything starts churning. What, what compels you to keep going even though you felt that bad? I think it was the fact that, um, okay, I've done this now. Maybe I can wean my way into the crowd and start doing it at school okay. and hopefully my head won't rush around so much anymore. Okay. Yeah. So th even though you're feeling physically unwell to the point where you're, you know, you, you're having trouble even standing up and you're, you <laughs> want to vomit, the notion of being popular, the notion of being more accepted, the notion of being identified as someone cool has much more strength and much more power than that your physical body saying this is this is doing me damage. That's how strong that is at you know, 14, 15. Yeah. What caused you to transition to marijuana from cigarettes and alcohol? You know, they're they're accessible, they're available. So what, you know, and and, and legal. Even though you're 14, it's illegal for you to have them. They are legal in, in society. What was the step? Or what was caused you to step into taking dope for the first time? Since I started smoking and hanging out with, um, I guess, the cooler kind of people at school, there was this guy, actually the guy who died in my car accident. Yeah, he goes, Jenna, come over to my place one night um, and, we'll, and we'll have some bongs. And I had no idea what that was at the time. Yeah. I had no idea what I was doing. I had no education about it. No one I knew or no one in my family, of course, ever touched that stuff yeah, ever. Sure. My family don't even drink or smoke. And um, so I went there that night, that afternoon after school. We went up to his shed and um, he pulled out this contraption and I had no idea what it was. I had no idea what he was even chopping up yeah, and mixing with tobacco. Yeah, you know? so why would you? This yeah. is illegal. You know? So yeah. yeah, I get that. And uh, so he taught me how to pull a cone and I had it, and um, the feelings I got after that was so weird. I've never felt like that in my entire life. It was so weird. Weird, good, weird, bad, weird, just weird. Just weird. It okay. was good, but bad because okay, I had yeah. I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah, okay. I didn't understand how I was feeling. So here's this person who's you know, new friend in the cool set, introduces you to this stuff you know nothing about, but it seems to be okay because my friend who's cool is giving this to me. Yes. So this this can't be all bad. I've got to try this, at least try it. I mean, if I don't try it, I'm a bit of a, a wuss. But if I try it, I'm okay. That's kind of what's going on. Yeah. And you're feeling weird, still not feeling great. It's not like, wow, this is fantastic. Can I have another one? Okay, again, what prompts you to keep going? What is it that keeps you drawing into this, this substance that's obviously not doing a great deal for you at all, other than your social kudos? What keeps drawing you into it? I'd have to say, uh, again, the social aspect, uh, because more and more people started to um, become my friend yeah, okay. as a consequence of doing that. The normal thing that would go and do was um, go and smoke bongs at someone's house. and But every time that I did it, it would become more and more uh, enjoyable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like things would seem so funny. Everything yeah. was just hilarious, even though it was we didn't even know what we were laughing about at the time. So um, it became fun for me to smoke with my friends. So you're acclimatised to it, and now, now you're starting to get some, you've got the social kudos out of it, now it's starting to make you laugh at things, so I've got a bit of humour out of it. It's becoming a, an activity we do together, passes the time. And just, I'll just throw in a, another option here. If, if there was, say, one or two girlfriends 
who were around at the time that you respected and you were friends with who said to you, Jenna, what, where are you going with this? Why are you touching this stuff? Would that have made a difference for you? There are people that you really cared about, you liked, you enjoyed their company. They were good friends who said to you, Jenna, man, what's going on with this? You know, this is crap, man, don't touch this. Do well, you think that would have made a difference to you? Yeah, definitely, because it would have put me, uh, put myself into perspective and uh, just realised that this is a bad thing that I was doing. Because yep. at the time I didn't really understand it. I really didn't, even when, you know, I found out it was marijuana yeah. and I knew marijuana was bad and illegal, but, you know, what difference was it really making in my life? I was now, I had more friends now and things just seemed better mm -hmm. in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wasn't lonely anymore. Yeah, yeah. powerful. Powerful, the, 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 that's the seduction, isn't it? That's yeah. one of the biggest seductions in this. Yeah, it, it's interesting. So you had no education, you're saying, on this particular issue, and, and why would you? Because it's a legal drug, but it would have been helpful if you had a bit. Definitely. Probably no word. You're, you're not aware of what's going on, you're not aware of how this stuff works, and all of a sudden you're being introduced to that, so this is a new experience for you with a friend. So you've got a, a well, I'll say it, a dodgy friend who's introdu introducing you to a dodgy product in a, in a manner that puts you under a bit of pressure to, to conform so you can fit. Mm. And you had no other peer support from people around you who were willing to say, this is a mistake that's respected. So that combination puts you in a pretty vulnerable place, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. You still made your own choices. No one had a gun to your head, right? No. no. But you are pretty vulnerable in those kind of environments, aren't you? To make bad choices. People who are in the scene who think this is a pretty cool, funky thing, and, oh, she's having a good time. It's not really bothering her too much. What's the problem? What's the problem? You know what I mean? She's made friends, so-called friends. She's happy. She's having a good time. She's cool. She's got a bit of kudos. What's the problem? What's the downside to this? What would you say to that? Uh, I'd say, well, there's nothing wrong with what I'm doing. I'm happy. Everyone else is happy. And at that stage, I didn't really, you know, realise if it had an impact on anyone who I cared about, like, you know, my, like my family. I was just in my own little world. <laughs> Everything seemed really good. Again, that's an uh, interesting part of the culture. It's like, what I do for me is my business, and I'm the king of my own world, and uh, who cares what happens to anybody else? It's not really my issue. Mm. I'm not hurting anybody else. Well, we don't think we are, but as you just said, we are hurting other relationships. We are hurting ourselves. now. In that area, hurting yourself, obviously having a few bongs with your mates. How, how many times a week were you chuffing? At least three or four times a week. Okay. Yeah. This is at high school? Yeah. Yeah. And was it lots of kids doing this or was it uh, compared to the whole school, you know, your whole year level? Was it you know, 50% of the year level doing it? Or? Oh, no, no way. Yeah. I, I don't think too many people were doing it. Mm. It's hard to say. There was a few kids doing it, but sure. not a lot. So I think it's a select group of kind of rebellious people that are on the edge and, you know, trying to be hardcore. And I'm sure the rest of the classmates would have known about it and said, oh, yeah, they're the, they're the, they're the cool kids or they're the hardcore kids or something to, to, that, to yeah. that effect. Yeah, I think it had a couple of effects. Like in high school, um, I think you'd have your people who would think, yeah, that's pretty cool, they're hardcore, you know. But um, there'd be the other people who were popular but would look down at us as well because um, it was, I guess, antisocial. Yeah, so that's kind of the the extreme of being popular, but being popular, but antisocial. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Interesting, because there's a, a growing propaganda push out there by, not by young people, but by certain pro-drug lobby groups, very small lobby groups, very powerful and well-funded. They're saying, well, you know, young people are experimenters and most young people try drugs. Well, by your own admission, some people thought you were cool, but didn't try. Some people, they thought you were cool and were in it, and they were the ones who are drawing you into it. And a lot of people who thought uh, that they didn't use drugs, they thought you were uncool. Yeah. In fact, they were popular. So we're talking the vast majority of young people, I and mean, we were talking only the last, you know, five, ten years, are going, in high school, are going, this is, this is not what we think's a good idea. Is that a fair evaluation? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so it's interesting because the propaganda out there is quite disturbing because I'm dealing with the grown-up population, you know, so-called grown-ups, you know. Mm. They've got this agenda and they're pushing it pretty hard and they, they use data like, oh, well, most young people try drugs. I mean, most young people, they might do a survey and talk about drugs and a kid thinks about drugs or has been offered drugs or is, you know, may have been at a party and, you know, had a chuff on a joint and all of a sudden, oh, that's proof they've tried drugs. And so therefore, everyone's trying it. Let's just let it off the leash. 
but that's not the case because certainly your story is indicative of what I'm bumping into quite a bit. <laughs> You've spoken a few bongs at school and some of the pro drug lobby people might say, oh, you know, marijuana's harmless, it's okay, but but you start moving into things like, you know, ATSs, you know, amphetamine type substances and uh, some of the opiates, heroin. They're kind of, that's the hard drugs, you know, that's like marijuana and alcohol, the soft drugs. Mm -hmm. But then you move into the hard drugs. Did you, did you actually move into the hard drug space at any point? I did. I was only 15 years old as well. Ooh. Yep. Uh, the first thing uh, of the harder drugs, as they say, I moved into was speed. Mm -hmm. Uh, I remember I had this boyfriend and uh, we were in his caravan and I can't even remember where it came from but um, somehow we obtained some speed and uh, we took it and um, then I'd find myself venturing out in the city and not coming back for about three days and just being awake for three days walking around and just doing nothing you know just being off my face with these with my boyfriend at the time and his mate just yeah at 15 years old. I, just, I don't understand what we were doing or why, but um. You know, when you were speeding, now speedy obviously is a uh, a stimulant, you know, yep. and it, as we've talked, as we'll talk about in, in this DVD series, it jacks you up a bit, it keeps you wired for a number of days, as you've experienced. It does. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, and obviously that's not all good. That's kind of like you're saying you're walking around like doing nothing for three days because you can't sleep. Mm. So is that a fun thing? Absolutely not. Yeah, cool. <laughs> well, I mean, it seemed fun at the time, but looking back, I just think, why did I put myself in that danger? When you did come across the really uh, dangerous people who rolled my friend for his wallet and everything that he had, mm. that's when you kind of realise, what am I doing here? I had a few moments like, like that on that uh, trip, I suppose, mm. as you'd call it. Yeah. yeah. When, you, when you came down, because everything that goes up has got to come down, that's, and trying to manage the down with all sorts of gimmicks and ideas and fairy tales and myths, they don't work. The body's got to come down. What happens after your, your, your amphetamine rush? What happens after that to your body? Oh, you just absolutely feel like crap, and then you have to come home and face reality, because eventually you do have to come home and face your family. Well, I did at the time, because I was still living there. And uh, they'd say, where have you been? And I didn't even know how to answer that because not even I knew where I'd been. <laughs> wow. What was I doing for the last three days, you know? So physically sick? Haven't slept for three days, yeah. no food. Yuck. Yeah, <laughs> not a nice feeling. What about heroin opioids? You know, did you try anything like that? Uh, I touched that once when I was younger. I smoked it. Right, okay. And uh, it was a pretty incredible feeling, but it was very Moorish. I can see where the danger is there. When I was out in my adventures in the city of my three day bender, I saw people who were <clears throat> badly affected by heroin. Mm, I made that decision that I did not want to be like that at all because these people were using uh, needles. Yeah, yeah. And even though I smoked it, I could see myself just not in a good journey from that. Yeah. Okay, so that was a bit of a wake up for you right there on that, that on that drug you could say, okay, this is actually appealing to me, mm -hmm. I'm liking this, but I'm also seeing what it's done, where this can lead. And you actually made a brake decision, like what I call, what I, call I, I put the foot on the brake decision. I'm not going to do this. Yep. The final part of your brain went, I've evaluated this, this is not good. <laughs> yeah. But that same evaluation process, you couldn't apply that to the other drugs. You couldn't, you couldn't go back, well actually I'm managing this, I'm managing the speed, I'm managing the dope, I'm managing the booze, I'm managing the singers. But I couldn't manage that. It's interesting, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Up until the car accident, obviously that, that, that fateful night, which changed your life. And, and obviously, uh, as much as there's tragedy involved, it's changed for the better because I'm dealing with a person here who's got focus, direction. They know what they want to do. They want to make a difference. They're not just living to party anymore, uh, which is exciting. So that's a wonderful outcome uh, from a tragic event. But you know, up until the night of the accident, obviously that, that fateful night, was there ever a point in that, what, six year journey before that, that you actually thought you had a problem with this crap? No, not once. Not once. I always thought it was under control. Okay. Yep. You always thought you were under control? Always. There were times though when uh, I did feel like I needed to have a cone, a bong. Mm -hmm. I needed some chuff just to relax or that was just the normal part of my day. If I'd come back from work uh, and not have a bong, I wouldn't be settled. 
So sometimes I did realise I had a problem with weed, but with all the other stuff, no, not at all. Always thought it was under control. control. Which is interesting, isn't it? Because there's a, a new push again for the pro-drug lobby. They say things like, uh, they use terms like problematic drug use or drug misuse. It's a new term because in your space, by your own admission, I didn't have a problem with this. So, and by their admission too, it's, it's, she's not a problematic drug user. She's a drug user, but it's not causing her problems. She's functioning. She's not misusing drugs. She's just using them and she has the right to do that. But the whole time you were doing that, you've just admitted with the marijuana, you needed that to take the edge off. Yeah. And the other stuff, you had no awareness at all that this was a problem. No, nope. it was just a normal part of uh, what I like to do on the weekends. And I pretty much um, justified it in my head that only because it was on the weekends it was okay, as long as it's not interfering with my uh, Monday to Friday day-to-day -day life. Exactly the propaganda that the pro-drug lobby uses. But yet, you still had this car accident. And again, you mentioned to me that you had no memory at all from uh, before you got into the car, or was it even earlier than that, until you woke up in hospital three days later? What I remember was um, driving to the place, to our mate's place where we got the G. I remember having it. I remember a little bit of the drive home, but then afterwards, not nothing. Mm. Just waking up and then, um, you know, people are telling me what happened. And that's not problematic drug use? <laughs> when you put it like that. <laughs> Fascinating, isn't it? Yeah, I, I was okay. I, I, I just forgot certain bits. I drove a car under the influence of drugs. Everything was normal in your world, your perception of normal. Yeah. Do you think people looking in from the outside would have noticed a change in you? Yeah, for sure, yeah. Okay. Like everything was just fun. Every day was a party. That's all I wanted. I just wanted fun, fun, fun with no consequences. But I think if uh, someone was watching me, like my family, they would have realised something was up. So again, there's a perception. You don't see you've got a problematic, problematic drug use issue. Other people looking in from the outside can go, Wow, we think you've got an issue with this. So in this, this kind of space you're in, I'm using on a fairly consistent basis, or certainly regularly, certainly every weekend, I'm using illicit drugs for recreational purposes uh, so you can have fun. A year before the accident, if I had met you, then I realised after you know hanging out with you for a couple of weeks that you are a drug user. I picked it up pretty quickly because you're using it. And I challenged you on that and I said, Jenna, why are you doing this? You know, this, is a, this is a problem, this is an issue. What would you have said to me then, a year before the accident? What would you have said to me if I said you had an issue and I don't like what you're doing? I probably would have gotten pretty defensive about it and said, what's it to you? I'm okay, I'm just doing my thing, I'm having fun, I'm still functioning. Probably to butt out, mm. leave me alone. Yep, that's what I was like. So you'd say that to a friend who cared about you? Oh, depended on how well the friendship was. Yeah, well that's what I was saying. And how much I respected them. Yeah. I think, I think I still would have gotten defensive and if there was a small feeling in my mind that I felt that they were right, I probably would have um, chopped them out of the picture, okay. ignored them. Okay, so just wide berth that person? Yep. So anyone's going to challenge my way of living, make, my, make me feel bad about my decisions, I'm going to get them out of the road. I'm just yep. going to ignore them. Yep. Yeah, okay. Because for me, if I didn't have it, then it wasn't fun. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what was fun without it and going out to nightclubs. Not problematic drug use, of course. No, oh, no, 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 I've got no problem with this. But now we're in a space where I can't take advice, I can't take criticism, I can't function socially without this, I need it to have fun, and I will lose friendships to defend my drug use. And that's not problematic. Fascinating, isn't it? Because problematic drug use, according to some of these you know, unscrupulous people that are promoting you know, the legalisation or decriminalisation of drugs, these people keep saying, oh, well, they, they go to work nine to five, they do their job, they manage to keep relationships. Well, we've just seen relationships of what kind, we're not sure. They pay their bills, they pay their taxes, they don't have car accidents. Well, not for a while anyway. Mm. And so they're not problematic. Uh, what would you say to, to people who, who promote that kind of ideology? I would say to them, well, Technically, <laughs> looking back now, yeah, I was only taking drugs on the weekend, but you know what? It does affect your week because on Monday and Tuesday, you are so coming down and hung over that you can't function properly. You most likely call in sick on a Monday anyway. Wednesday, you're sort of feeling back to normal, but then it comes Thursday and Friday, and by that time, 
you're waiting for your pay to come in so that you can go and chase drugs again for the weekend. And then by Friday, you're so excited about what you're going to do tonight, you can't even concentrate at work. So really, thinking about it like that, yeah, it does affect, you know, everything. And that's just on one level. We haven't talked about real relationships. We haven't talked about, you know, life decisions and careers. We haven't talked about anything. It's just talking about a basic functioning day to day, go to work, come home, go out and do your thing kind of job. Let alone parenting, uh, you know, mm. committed relationships, responsibilities. If you could have your time again, right back to 14, that first cigarette, that first bong, if there was changes you could have made or ingredients you could have had in your world or people you could have had in your world, what changes would you make and what decisions would be different? You're right, that is a really hard question. Really, really hard. Because what it comes down to, it's probably a common answer as well. If I didn't experience everything that I've experienced, I wouldn't be who I am today. In a way, I probably wouldn't want to change anything. However, if there was someone around, not even just someone, just something around me at that time who could uh, educate me in a way that I could understand the consequences of picking up that first cigarette mm. or having that first bong, I wish I had something or someone like that around to just tell me what was going to happen, where I could end up, like prison, you know? Because if I didn't have that first bong, where would I be now? I'd probably be a doctor. I was so smart. I was getting A grades my whole way through primary school and high school up until, you know, year eight. Yeah, it's really hard. But if I didn't do all that, then I wouldn't have had the experiences that I've had. So. It... Yep, and I, I think that's a wonderful redemptive perspective. In other words, I've had some bad experiences. It's turned my life around. I'm now on a better journey, which is great. However, the, the downside of that that answer, as you just said, is that you got to go through all that that stuff to get to that point. Mm. And as you've just admitted, what would have happened if you hadn't have taken those drugs? Would you have been a doctor? Certainly your friend would be alive today. The potential that you have as a person, and still have, but the potential is you had a young person because your brain, between the ages of about 12 and 20, 25, that's, that's the, the important time, is the second most important developmental phase in its life. And every substance that you put in that brain does its damage. Your absorption rates are a lot higher, your metabolic rates are a lot slower, so you don't process it well, and it does do damage to your brain and your potential. So just on that level, it does damage to your potential. So good education, not just about the consequences that's important, not just about what drugs do to you, but about why you would take them and what are some of the benefits of not taking them because ultimately there's a, a better way forward. Knowing that you know you're in a new space now, which is wonderful, and you're you're moving forward because you're off drugs now. You're not taking them anymore. Yep. You're not no. you're not planning to take them anymore. No. <laughs> so that's a great that's a great message you can send to, to young people who thinks that this is normal, functional thing to do. And you're moving forward, which is great. But if there's a message you could give to young people, that having been through what you've been through, and where you are now, what would be the message you want to say to you know a bunch of 14 year old boys and girls, 15 year old boys and girls? who are thinking, looking at all the, the, the propaganda that's been thrown at them at the moment about, you know, cannabis is harmless, and which is absolute rubbish. Uh, you know, it's okay to pop an ecky every now and then, it's good fun to have a party, raves are cool with drugs and all that sort of stuff. What would be the message that you'd like to give to them? I would say to them, think twice, don't do it. And, um, you know, it's easy for me to say that without them having experienced why or from it just coming out of my mouth, someone that they probably don't even know and all that. But I'd want to say to them, think twice about it. Think really, really hard about what you're doing because someone so intelligent and with so much potential as a young person, with that kind of stuff, you don't know where you're going to end up. I would never have pictured myself being in prison, never. I was always such a good girl and, you know, just from that, from the age of 14, just from making those small decisions, that's where it landed me. And maybe, maybe I was just unlucky, I don't know, but it could happen to anyone. It really can. So just, yep, think twice about it. Listen to the examples around you. Take notice. Good ones. Yeah. I, I guess it, directly relates to the drug use because 
um, I, f I saw this ad in the paper. I was unemployed. I was about 19 and yeah, just after high school. And um, it was like for photo shoots. Oh yeah, yeah. So um, I called this guy and he's got all these girls over at his house. I didn't realise they were naked photo shoots. Okay. Yeah, so I get into doing this um, modelling, glamour shots they call them. Me now, I'm not that kind of person to go and flash myself all over magazines. But that's exactly what I did. It was good money. It got me my cash for the weekend. It was um, instant money and it was um, like I'd go into magazines. And then I ended up winning this um, this stupid competition which people call in and vote for you. Yep. So I won about three grand and I got the front cover, centrefold and five pages of the magazine. They flew me up to Queensland, the Gold Coast, to do a photo shoot. That's how I bought my car. But, you know, something really creepy happened after my car accident. And this was probably about uh, five years, or four or five years after the um, actual uh, competition. I'm out at this nightclub with my boyfriend at the time and it's really loud and I can't hear anything, but this guy comes up to me and he goes, hey Amber, because Amber was my pseudo name. Oh, okay. It was my alias. And he goes, how's the snowboarding going, Amber? You're obviously still like raving. I said, what do you mean? He goes, Amber, isn't that your name? And I just looked at him and I thought, oh my goodness, you know me from my photo shoot. That is so creepy. It's been four years and you still know my name. And that is just, I got really freaked out. And uh, it's not me to have done that. I think that was the drugs, even though that was during the week what I was doing, it was the drugs talking. It made me not care about um, basically my self-respect. Yeah. And I was happy to flush my body all over magazines and the internet and it was just... Uninhibited. Drugs and alcohol, and well, alcohol is a drug of course, there's a disinhibitor. It, it, as I said, it works on the frontal cortex of the brain. It's, it takes away all the, you shouldn't do the brakes on the brain. You shouldn't do this. It's not a good idea to do this. Mm. This is not smart. There are consequences to this. But in the back part of the brain, which has been fed by this, going, hey, go for it, go for it, it's going to be fun, it's going to be fun, it's going to be fun, it's going to get money out of this, cool, don't worry about the consequences, who cares, you know? And that's, and that's what's going on, and you're right, the drugs, the drugs induce that, that, that decision, that decision you still made, but it's been induced by the impact of, of substances in your body that wouldn't be there. Now, this is the, uh, the, the, the 2010s, you know, this is the, the new era of do whatever you feel like, it's all hmm. good for you. Are you happy with the idea of naked photos being around pretty much anywhere and everywhere these days of you abroad? Is that something that you're happy about? No way. I'm just so embarrassed and ashamed of myself now for doing that. I mean, not everyone feels the same, but um, it's just not me at all. <laughs> I don't know what I was going to turn out to be because eventually that uh, guy who I called um, in the first place to do these shoots, he tried to... Um, get me to do videos with him for the internet. Mm -hmm. And then he, eventually he tried to um, get work for me as a prostitute. And I'm just thinking, uh, I guess the frontal lobe <laughs> of my brain was working back then because I did make the decision that I didn't want to do that. That's good. But I just thought, okay, imagine if I was really addicted to drugs or you know whatever I was doing at the time and did decide to do that. Imagine how bad I could be right now. Yeah. <laughs>